Are you ready to put down that drink or drug for good? Are you struggling to maintain your recovery from addictive behaviors? Do you need help with a family member or loved one who's in early recovery or battling addiction? Get the help and guidance you need by arranging a recovery recharged phone session with me, Ellen Stewart, Pushy Broad from the Bronx, Certified Life and Recovery Coach. Call 1-800-889-1757. Make an appointment today. Or go to my website, pushybroadfromthebronx.com, and click on the link that says Recovery Recharged. Don't wait. Get the help you need today. This is Ellen Stewart, Pushy Broad from the Bronx, on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Hey there, I'm Ellen Stewart, the Pushy Broad from the Bronx. Welcome to my show, Recovery Recharged. I am so delighted today to bring you a show that I know is going to be very powerful for you. The name of this show today is called It Will Never Happen to Me. It is a book title by Dr. Claudia Black, and we are going to talk about what it's like to grow up with addiction as youngsters, adolescents, and adults. I am so glad that you're listening in today or you're watching us on Facebook and YouTube because Dr. Black is going to give us some insights as to what it's like to be an adolescent around addiction. But before I introduce her to you, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about who she is and why she's here today. So, Dr. Black, Ph.D., is a world-renowned expert on addiction and codependency. She is a best-selling author, a trainer internationally recognized for her pioneering and contemporary work with family systems and addictive disorders. Her writings and teachings have become standard in the field of addictions. She holds a doctorate in philosophy in social psychology from Columbia Pacific University. She is also the clinical architect of the Claudia Black Center for Young Adults, a senior fellow and addiction and trauma program specialist at the Meadows Treatment Center in Arizona, a treatment center that I know well and highly recommend. She is one of the original founders and serves on the advisory board for the National Association of Children of Alcoholics and the Advisory Council of the Aluna Foundation and its development of Campus Mariposa, a camp for children impacted by addiction. She serves on the advisory board for the National Association of Children of Alcoholics and the advisory council of the Moyer Foundation. I'm sure it's the Aluna Foundation. I'm sorry. (laughs) So this is a woman who is highly qualified to talk to us today about something extremely important. She's going to talk to us about children who grow up in addictive families and abide by certain rules. And I'm going to call her and, and I'm going to make sure that we call her on it and she talks about it. That is don't talk. Don't trust, don't feel. She's going to tell us about those rules in her worldwide bestseller. And here it is. I'm holding it up for you guys. It will never happen to me. And you notice I've dog-eared it because I've read it from cover to cover. Growing up with addiction as youngsters, adolescents, and adults. So... I am proud on Recovery Recharged as the Pushy Broad from the Bronx to introduce Dr. Claudia Black. Welcome. How are you? Hello, everybody. I'm really good, and it's a pleasure to be here. This book is the third edition, as I understand it, so there is a lot of information to cover. But what prompted you is something rather personal. Can you talk about what inspired you to write this book? I, one, let me say I grew up in a home that is a lot about what it is that I talk about and the work that I've done for the last 40 years in this field. And having grown up in a family affected by addiction and so many of the ramifications of that, such as uh, violence and physical abuse, for me, I learned, I came to believe at a very young age that nobody deserves to live with the kind of fear that permeates the family affected by addiction. And when I say nobody, I'm not talking just about children raised in families, I'm talking about the partners, and I'm also talking about the addicted person. And not only did I somehow was blessed enough to hang on to that belief that people do not deserve to live with that kind of fear, they also don't need deserve to live with the shame, that internalized belief that who I am is not good enough. And that's oftentimes the consequence for kids living in this kind of family. That's also the consequence oftentimes for the partner and for the addicted person. And 
somehow I had the resiliency and the strength to hang on to that belief, which would certainly help me in my own personal growth. But I really felt passionate about that um, to the point that, you know, I've really dedicated my whole life to working with families affected by addiction, various addictions. Have you been personally affected in your family by addiction? I don't think it is possible, Ellen, to be raised in a family with addiction and not be affected negatively. And it varies. I mean, there's reasons that some kids are affected, impacted more severely than others. And we can talk about what some of those variances are. But I don't think you can be raised in a family with addiction and not have some kind of negative impact. And It has a lot to do with the beliefs that you internalize about yourself. Um, You know, for me, I learned at a very young age uh, that I brought stability to my home by being that hero responsible child that I talk about, and it will never happen to me. But I also was a combination of being that caretaker. And there's a lot of strengths that can come with our survival roles, whatever they are. It can be the comic in the family. It can be the lost child in the family. It can even be the very angry child in the family. And those strengths work for us in our growing up years, but it's what we don't get to learn along the way that comes to create our vulnerabilities that often cause problems for us in our adult life. So for me as a child, I learned how to take charge. I learned how to, when I say take charge, you know, problem solve. I learned how I was very passionate and compassionate about the painful feelings in the home. And so my job was to take the embarrassment out of the home, to do what I could to lessen the sadness, to appease to any degree possible that so that there wouldn't be any more anger than there already was in this house. And on one level, that gave me skills, as I was saying, you know, because today in my adult life, throughout my adult life, I do know how to lead. I know how to initiate. Um, And it's nice to be a warm, caring, compassionate person. But as I said, it's what you don't get to learn along the way. You don't get to learn things like how to be a team player. I know how to lead, but it was great difficulty knowing how to follow. Um, I know how to make decisions, but I have difficulty. I have had, I mean, recovery can really make the difference in this life. But when we don't have recovery, then we often don't know how to listen. When you're raised in a home where there's a sense of emotional crisis, your problem solving can get limited to all or nothing and you don't learn how to see choices that can be made available. When you're busy taking care of other people and their needs, you don't learn to value your own needs. And when you don't attach value to your own needs, they're probably not gonna get met. And you can go one of two ways. And for me, that is you become needless and in time, you can become depressed around that and or you become angry around that and act that out. And for all of us, irrespective of role, you often become frightened of your feelings and you learn how not to show those feelings to others, which creates problems and in intimate relationships. You know, you don't want to show people when you're sad. You don't want to let people know when you're afraid. And you can get so good at cutting yourself off that you don't even realize that. Oh, you know, I'm not, I'm not afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of here. Oh, that didn't make me sad. But as the kid is, oh, it didn't make me sad. There's enough sadness in this house. Oh, I'm not afraid because nobody's going to be there. Nothing good can happen with this fear. Uh, You discount your anger. And that's been a big one for me because there was enough anger in this house. There was no room for anybody else's anger, but my father's. So you become anger avoidant. Um, And then, you know, various dynamics. For me, I became a real perfectionist, but perfectionists struggle with no matter what I do, it's not good enough. And then that inability to feel good about yourself and push you to excel, to be the best with fear and shame, always sort of nipping at the seat of your pants. I understand. So what happens is even from a very early age, we get a sense of something is not right in the household, very basically for our listeners. And addiction in many cases, and what you're talking about in the book, really centers around either alcoholism or drug abuse, uh, or maybe other addictions that would directly affect the family, like maybe eating disorders or gambling or, of that nature, but mostly a substance abuse problem. And even in an early age, we get to understand that what's happening in the household evokes fear and shame. 
and you talk about that and you process that and you talk about your personal experience. What's interesting to me is that the anger builds up. And you said, working in juvenile detention, that you saw many children with fetal alcohol syndrome that um, dispelled that anger, and you could sense that anger in them. And then you said something really interesting. You said that they transform that anger into caretaking and caring about their siblings. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I see that in some of my clients, where the anger turns into caretaking. Okay. You know, I think that we have so much to feel about in general. And we have so much in which to be angry about, um, you know, for the partners and for the children who are being raised in the home. But the consequences, the fear of what would happen should you own that anger. And then you've been given messages that you don't have anything to be angry about. If anything, you need to be grateful is one of those messages that you get. So that anger really implodes. Um, And what I mean by that is it goes within. And in time, we learn to disconnect from that. And I think what is really key about children in addictive homes is I do whatever it is that's necessary for my sense of survivorship. And with that, it's usually what we're talking about here is that combination of roles. It doesn't work for me to to be with this anger What does work for me is to focus on you. So I focus less on myself and I focus more on you. And what can I do for you so you don't go into this anger because anger is not safe in the context of this family. And that's when I start to focus on taking care of all of these kinds of feelings you have. I understand. Back and say something that you actually just um, alluded to. Actually, you said it very clearly, but I want to say more about it, is that kids at a very young age, three, four years of age, they know that something's not right in this family. And we take on these dysfunctional roles and these dysfunctional rules at a very young age. I may not know that it is a gambling addiction. I may not know that my mother is depressed. I may not know that my dad is a drug addict or alcoholic, but I know that something is wrong. And sometimes they can go through their whole childhood and not be able to name it for what it is. Sometimes we cannot name it for what it is because the actual addiction, the use of the substance isn't blatant to us. The gambling doesn't take place in the home. Maybe even the using doesn't take place in the home. What we see are the emotional consequences of this. The other reason is it also could be normalized. This may be what the extended family behaves like. This could be what a lot of the community behaves like. So one of the consequences is I can develop as a person raised in this kind of family, what is called a high tolerance for inappropriate behavior. And that inappropriate behavior is simply the norm. And I wouldn't know what healthy drinking looked like or so-called socialized drinking looked like. I only know what abusive alcoholic drinking looks like. And yet nobody's named it for such. And when that happens, children in the home tend to overcompensate. They either go in the direction of their parents, like you mentioned, right? Because there's a lot of trauma and stress that is naturally happening that children get used to. They get used to that chaotic norm that you mentioned. And with that, sometimes they continue on into adulthood and they form the same patterns of behavior, correct? They do. Children of addiction particularly when we talk about substance use disorders, they are more apt to be the ones to become addicted to substances themselves. They are also the ones more apt to get into a committed relationship with somebody who's addicted to substances themselves. Now there's a host of reasons, but there's I think three predominant reasons. One is in terms of becoming addicted myself. I very possibly have a genetic predisposition towards And that's most notable when it's not just your immediate parent, but it could be their parent as well. Also remember, not necessarily named for what it is. So there is a genetic predisposition so oftentimes, but it's usually, that's not a given that you're going to become an addict. It's usually that predisposition coupled with some kind of psychological injury. And that's the emotional consequences of being raised like this. And I want to talk about that in just a second, but one genetics, two That's what's been modeled for you in terms of coping, in that um, that's what 
uh, drinking and using is what you do when you are out having fun. You don't see people having fun unless they're engaged in drinking and using. That's what you see people do to relax. You don't see them do other things to learn how to relax. So that's what's modeled for us and we don't haven't learned anything else. But one of the biggest reasons is that alcohol and drugs becomes an anesthetizer. It is a medicator to one's emotional pain. So when nothing else has been modeled and heaven help you have a genetic predisposition, a little boy, not actually, he was in his 20s, but described, he said, I was 11 when I took my first drink and I hated the taste. I hated it, but I felt the glow. I had a hole in my gut that was so big and it was only alcohol and drugs that would fill it up. And I drank and I used to get absolutely blithering numb. You're absolutely right. All of the clients that I see, and I'm sure the people that you see in treatment as well, the number one reason that any alcoholic that I have ever spoken to has said, I drank to that that rate that you talked about was to absolutely escape, numb out, no feelings at all. It's to dispel that feeling. And many ACOA, adult children of alcoholics that I talk to as well, because of all of the chaos and the crisis that has occurred in their family growing up, the only way to suppress their feelings of fear and shame and guilt and anger was to do exactly what their parents did and drink to numb everything. And if we go back to the roles, we can think about what they can do for the different individuals. If I'm that responsible child, that hero child, and I'm carrying the burden of the world on my shoulders, trying to stabilize everything here, when I'm under the influence for just this moment, I don't feel the weight of the world on me. If I'm that child taking care of everybody else's emotional needs, for just this moment, I'd like to think about myself. If I'm that child who is what I call the adjuster and I move into the woodwork and I try and be invisible for just this moment, I would like a little bit of attention. Now, does that make me addicted? No, but it makes me thirsty. It makes me want a second drink, a third drink, a second toke, whatever that drug of choice is, a second and third time, because it really allows me to get in touch with a part of me. I never had the opportunity to learn more naturally. You're absolutely right. And that happens when I hear from my clients saying, it lets go of my inhibitions. I want to come out there and show people who I am. And I want to talk about that a little bit more before we break, because I really want you to break down the roles of each child, because I think that our listeners may be able to identify certain things. And maybe their children can get an idea if they fit into those roles and those adults can identify with them. So let's talk about them. Let's talk about the responsible uh, uh, child and the adapter a little bit more defined. Okay. Can you do that for us? Certainly. First, let me say that children in all families will take on certain roles to a degree. What is different about a family where there is addiction and trauma is this is what they need to do for their emotional survivorship. So they adhere to these roles more rigidly. And with that, as I adhere to them is what, again, I don't learn that ultimately gets me into trouble. Many, and it's often your older kids in the family, become what I, in my writing, refer to as responsible hero children. I'm the one who takes charge of what's going on in this family. I become the parent to myself. I become the parent to any siblings that I have. And I oftentimes take on that parental role uh, with one or two of my parents, or I join the other parent in being that second or third parent in the context of the home. Is that possibly the oldest child in the family or it doesn't More necessarily- likely than not the oldest child. More likely oh, really? than not the oldest, yes. Then you have that child who, and many people are going to be a combination, but they usually have one primary and one secondary. And then you have the one I already spoke about a little bit, who's what I call the family placator. I often think of them as the family social worker. My predominant need is to take care of the emotions in this family and to do what I can to quiet all the the disturbing emotions that are going on, take the fear out of the home, take the embarrassment. I will dance on the rooftop um, so that you're not feeling the embarrassment that you're feeling right now. I will do whatever I need to do to take the disappointment out of the home. And then you have what we call the adjusting child, sometimes thought of as the lost child. People can name them differently for themselves, but um, just to generalize here, this uh, adjusting child is 
shows all the flexibility in the world, which can be a nice characteristic, but they have to be following somebody all of the time. And so they, will, they just are totally flexible. Um, if you move 17 times, they're going to move 17 times and never complain about it. Um, and they're the ones who are more apt to be invisible. And uh, mom and dad can be in a big fight and they're just staring at the TV screen and, you know, they're not going to hear what it is that's going on. For them, what's happening around them, um, they've got themselves in this little bubble here. These are also the kids that when you ask mom or dad about them, well, they're the, this is the child. When you, you're taking all the kids to the grocery store and you get in the car and you head home, this is the one that got left at the grocery store and you didn't realize you even left them there. They're that invisible to you. Then you often have the re person who brings relief to the home and that's the comic or the mascot is what I call this person in the book. They br bring relief to the home by being cute and being funny and um, some, you know, just for this moment, we get to laugh because of this child's antics. And then you have the child who's very angry and they show their anger. And I, as I say, they walk through life with their fists clenched, sometimes their fingers protruding and they're saying there's something very wrong in my life and you are going to notice. And you know, they get noticed. They get noticed by the school teacher. They get noticed by the school counselor. In time, they get noticed by the principal, and maybe they get noticed by the, the judge. They get noticed, but then their problematic behavior gets identified as the problem, not the system from which they are reacting to. And I'm sure all of them get identified by their problems and not the system they're reacting to, which is... But the majority do not get recognized as having problems until they get into adulthood. There the other... With the exception of the angry child, the rest of them are what I refer to in this book as the looking good kids. And not only do they look good to the rest of the world in a way that they don't draw any negative attention to themselves, but then they pat themselves on the back for doing so well in spite of. Well, sometimes that does manifest itself in adulthood. Do you not see sometimes that despite all of the things that happen in a family that gives them the propensity to be addicts themselves, that some of these adults, when they you know, reach a certain age, actually overcompensate and do everything they can not to be the examples that were given to them? Do you find that as a success, or do you find over and over again ACOA uh, adults are have their share of problems? It's, ACOAs have their share of problems and it certainly exists along a continuum in terms of the severity of that. But the kinds of things I'm going to see is depression. And that may be major depression. That may be a, a low line depression, something called dysthymia. I think of that as closeted depression. We are so good at compartmentalizing when we're raised in these kinds of families that I'm talking about today that, you know, when I go to school, you know, and I've been up all night listening to my parents argue, you know, when somebody says, why are you tired? I don't say, hey, do you want me to tell you what my dad said to my mom last night for several hours? You know, I just shine it on. So I sort of, when I step outside of that family home, I step into another world and that brings me a sense of survivorship. Well, we can do that with our depression, with our despairing thoughts, with our self-loathing thoughts. And we can get so good at that that we can function, we can show up to work, we can handle our responsibilities at home and other people don't see our inner despair. And that's what I mean by closeted depression. So I see a lot of depression amongst adult children. I see a lot of anxiety amongst them. I see a lot of, that can be generalized anxiety, that can be panic attacks. It could be certain kinds of phobias and a lot of social anxiety. You see a lot of difficulty with relationships because we don't have the skills for healthy intimacy. One, we don't know how to trust others. We don't know how to show our feelings. Um, we don't know how to talk honestly. We don't know how to problem solve. We don't know how to negotiate conflict. So we have lots of problems in relationships. Oh, boy, that answers a lot of questions for me, certainly. And I also find, too, that especially during the pandemic, when we are all virtual, that somebody that has problems with isolation, especially your, you know, that child that is kind of the lost child that um, creates their own fantasy world and doesn't understand what the real world is all about. And then I have a lot of clients as well that are now home by themselves without any roommates or at any relationships and don't know how to handle the isolation. That's They're right. completely lost. 
That's right. You know, it's interesting because for a lot of adult children without recovery, because we do need to talk about the fact that recovery can exist, but with a lot of adult children, busyness is their best defense. Um, particularly your responsible kids, the ones who are wanting to caretake other people as well. I need to stay busy and with the, um, in order for me to feel safe in the world and to be other focused so I don't have to focus on myself. And the pandemic is bringing their world, is creating a, a narrowness. And with that, sometimes there's just more of a mirror to what it is that's really going on inside of us. And then you have those others who are very happy at home in isolation in this pandemic because that's where they feel safest. And you hear a lot, I hear a lot of people talk about that, that, well, this isn't bothering me as much because um, I don't have to go out and and be so anxious about the rest of the world. Um, And so that's sort of a whole nother twist to this. I understand. We're going to talk more about that. I know we're going to take a break in a very short minute, on about a minute exactly. And we're going to talk in the next hour about all of the things in your book that talk about ways that we can not only identify this, but things we can do to begin to heal and talk about the treatment end of of your book. But I also wanted to um, ask you really... Uh, quickly, um, when you deal with adult children, those parents sometimes don't even see it as a problem. I'm sure you you talk to the family and they say, you know, what are you talking about? My kid is fine. There's no problem here, right? You see that a lot? I see that a lot. And it goes back to sort of the looking good phenomena in that what you see is sort of that outer shell that they present to the rest of the world. And often parents do not see their child to be having a problem until that child hits the wall and has a crisis. Exactly. Today, today I see that with self-harm. I see it with suicidal ideation. I see it with one bad relationship after the other. I see it with very poor parenting skills and they've got their kids getting into trouble. And you see it with addiction. And one of the things, and let me know, quickly well we let well hold that thought because we're I'll hold come that. back yes hold that because we're going to come back and we're t- going to talk about it i'm with claudia black it will never happen to me here's the book this is the pushy broad we'll be right back did you know that all of the shows on the transformation radio network are available as podcasts to stream or download really check us out go to transformationradio.fm We have business shows, spiritual shows, energy healing shows, and pretty much everything in between. Something for everyone guaranteed to inspire, educate, and transform. We are transforming the world one listener at a time. Learn how to lead a happier life on Miles to Go with Brittany Miles. How to lose to gain it all. Join Brittany every second and fourth Wednesday at 1 p.m. Pacific on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Listen as coach and healer Brittany Miles shares stories that teach you about surrender. For more information about Brittany, MilesToGoCoaching.com. Tune in to the show Heart Change Consciousness with me, Dr. Trish DeRocher, as stories of inspired activism come to life. Listening to conversations with your favorite authors, change makers, and many more who practice inspired spiritual activism and transform vulnerabilities into sources of strength. Let's be inspired together through my show, Heart Change Consciousness, on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show, talk radio to thrive by. I am so thrilled to be talking to all of you. We have got talk radio for all of us. Are you ready and willing and able to accept all of the abundance you can muster up in your life? Check us out at drpatshow.com, transformationtalkradio.com, transformationradio.fm. Oh, my goodness. Are you ready to branch out? Take a leap of faith. Tune in to Get Rooted Radio with Erica Gifford Mills on TransformationTalkRadio.com to equip, empower, and enlighten yourself. Erica will energize and excite you to power up your passionate dream that sets your soul on fire. So get fearlessly ready and get powerfully rooted in your yes to live it up, love it up, and let it go. Visit GetRootedRadio.com. 
What would you do with the power of community? How do you create your own rituals? Tune in to Living Your Gifts with me, Susan Huff, Ancient Applications for Modern Times, the second Wednesday of each month on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Our lives begin with the stories we are told and the stories we tell ourselves. Storytelling is the key. To learn more about me, visit LivingYourGifts.com. That's LivingYourGifts.com. Hey, everyone. It's Ellen Stewart, the Pushy Broad from the Bronx. I am here with the Claudia Black, who has written an amazing book called It Will Never Happen to Me about growing up with addiction as youngsters, adolescents, and adults. And this is her third edition. And trust me when I tell you, there's a lot of good stuff in here. We were having a conversation about families that may have a substance abuse addiction and then their adolescent children may have um, gotten that from them but in a different way and in process addictions and we want to talk about exactly what that means so maybe it's a red flag for you or your family so claudia can you define and, and give us some examples of process addictions what i mean by a process addiction is really the compulsive engagement in the behavior that has the consequences of any other kind of addictive uh, substance. Like what? Such as uh, the interference in your social life, the interference in your education, the interference in, uh, you know, your, your thinking. It can even have an impact on you physically. But what I mean, examples of a behavioral addiction would be a gambling addiction. It would be a gaming addiction. It could be a screen addiction in general. It can be a sex addiction. It can be a porn addiction. And what happens is today we recognize in terms of uh, addiction being a brain disease that dopamine is a reward and that our brain is responding to the same in the same way that alcoholic drugs would to these kinds of behaviors when we engage in them in a compulsive nature. And I had wanted to make the point that I may have been raised in an alcoholic home. And Ellen, you said a little bit ago, and I'm going to make sure that I don't end up being alcoholic. And so I don't drink at all. But if I don't take care of all this emotional pain that I've been talking about in this session today, then what often happens is I end up with an addiction to a behavior. It could one, it could be a food addiction. It could be a gaming addiction. It could be a spending addiction. And I spend in a compulsive way that interferes in my life. You know, when we talked about the symptoms of an addiction too, is dishonesty and lying and rationalizing. And you're going to see that with all of these other kinds of addictions. So in an attempt to make sure Sure, I don't end up like maybe my mother who was a compulsive overeater. Maybe my addiction ends up being a pill addiction. If to make sure I don't end up being a gambler like my father, then maybe my addiction ends up being a uh, a sex addict. If I'm a sex addict or raised with a sex addict, then maybe my addiction is, you know, gosh knows what. But the point being is, it doesn't have to be the same drug of choice that my parent was addicted to. It's a very interesting concept because in some ways it fosters the idea that even though we know addiction is a disease and we may be genetically predisposed, it's almost as if adolescents acquire this learned behavior in some way because somebody that is is actively addicted to alcohol or drugs may be dispensing in their behavior and their cognitive abilities a whole way to treat life that is intrinsically being taught and passed down to their children. Like you said, recovery is much more than just not picking up a drink or a drug. It's behavior, it's cognition, it's it's the ability to discern problems, it's honesty, it's all of those things you talked about. And when the adult is an active alcoholic, they're still teaching their children the kind of things that an active addict participates in. Yes. There's some merit to that? Such as they're teaching their children how to minimize, discount, and rationalize. They're teaching their children how to avoid feelings at any cost. They're teaching their children... Um, it's what they're also not teaching. They're not teaching their children healthy coping mechanisms. Um, so it's sometimes what we're blatantly teaching our children that can set them up, but sometimes it's what we're not teaching them that will set them up. 
And there's another really important point here is that almost everything I've said, you can transfer to who I choose in terms of my partner. I can so want to make sure I don't end up with a, a husband or a wife or a partner that is a drug addict like my mother or father. So that I choose somebody who totally abstains from alcohol and drugs, but they have another behavioral addiction going on. And it could be food and it could be spending and it could be gaming and it could be porn. And then I get surprised and yet generationally, one of the techniques, and I don't know if I talk about this in this book, but it's a genogram that you look at the family tree and you can begin to see the different multiple addictions that pass down through the family. What I do talk about in this book is that uh, the idea of multiple addictions, usually when there's one addiction within the family, there will be a second and third addiction within that family system. I know that I have seen it many, many times where I'm working with couples who are having a difficulty because one of them is an alcoholic or an addict and the other one is not and has abstained or doesn't feel that they have a problem. But when they talk about their lineage, they say, well, my father was an alcoholic or my last husband was an alcoholic. It really does tend to trend. It is absolutely a proven thing that people that are trying so hard to get away, like you said, from the addiction that they had in their family, just automatically replicate it, just like that. And what you see in the partner sometimes is somebody who's highly rigid and controlling. You see somebody in the partnership who, um, you know, doesn't know how to have intimacy themselves. It's not just the addicted person. Uh, You might see somebody in the partner who's just been spending years accommodating because that's what they spent as a childhood was accommodating. Um, You often see somebody in the partner who's the adult child who's fearful of even asking for help. One of the things I hear all the time is, well, I didn't want him to get help. I just wanted him to stop. Exactly. Uh, I think somebody could be helpful to me is absolutely foreign. Right. Or you get the wife that says, I want to take care of this little puppy because I know that he needs some help. So I'm going to mother him and take care of him the way maybe her mother did that for um, or the father or suppressing the anger and becoming the caretaker that you talked about. I want to make sure that the family is okay and I will take care of him and it'll be all right and I'll fix everything. It'll be fine to adjust. I want to say that, you know, my father was alcoholic and became violent. And I loved my father um, in spite of that. I was also very afraid of my father. And I also internalized a lot of shame around various issues. But I did love him. And and I think a lot of people identify with that. But where we get into trouble with relationships is we can see beyond that bad behavior to that person who they really are. And so I see a lot of people partner with somebody. I've had people say, oh, I knew she was addicted when I got together with her. Or, you know, I figured it out fairly soon. But, you know, my mom was like that or my dad was like that. And and I could handle it. And I can see beyond into the person they really are. Well, to me, though, today, I see that as um, low expectations, impoverished expectations that also come from low self-worth. I do not deserve any more than this. So... You know, I think that's kind to know that you can see beyond because in my work with addicted people, I want to be able to see beyond. But that doesn't mean I need to be married to them. That doesn't mean I need a committed, intimate relationship with them because I do believe I deserve more than that today. So what you're telling people to do is not to replicate those situations under any circumstances. Is that correct? Um, Well, One is, I hate to say that because sometimes we've replicated it and I don't want the viewer to say, oh, I've got to get out of this relationship. That's not necessarily true. No, you can get into your own healing and recovery and you can attempt to facilitate some other healing and recovery on the part of others, though you only have the power to affect your own. So I don't want to say jump out of this without taking some responsibility for your own recovery process um, and then to see how this system can shift. But what I do want to say is this dynamic of, well, you know, I can see beyond to such a good person. So I'll spend the next 50, 60 years with this is impoverished expectations is as hurtful to us as unrealistic expectations based in fantasy and adult children. We operate from extremes. Some of them go into the fantasy and with unrealistic expectations and others go into 
no expectations whatsoever. And then they just get walked on for the next several years. Exactly. So if you're in a marriage where you know you're married to an alcoholic, it's not acceptable to stay in that constant. What is acceptable is to make sure that you're getting help so that you understand the disease of addiction and that you engage or at least try to open up the door so that your husband or your wife can get similar help too. Absolutely. Right? And not walk away. I understand that. Well, you have some very interesting things in your book. And one of the things that I was really attracted to was chapter seven, where you talk about the adult child and what kinds of problems they may have today. And I know we've talked about it, but the best thing about it is you really have a very clear cut way for somebody to take kind of a quiz and talk about what we call, you know, almost a biopsychosocial here with all of their questionnaires and all of the things that maybe hit chapters. So if you're not immediately identifying yourself as an adult child of an alcoholic, this is something they can use and like a tool. Would you talk to me about that chapter? please actually i've not seen the book oh, um, you've not seen it and so the book is that new that i was going to say this and oh so my goodness i have is, a copy before you do you do um but i believe so let me say some things that i believe are in that chapter that i think really need to be said in it's this really scene. a biopsychosocial mom's side father's side parents i mean really and a filling out where you can actually fill out the forms here of everything, you know, answering every question, which is marvelous. The book is full of opportunities. I will share a lot with you. And then I say to you, how do you identify with this? Or I might give you a very specific exercise, which is what you're talking about in terms of, you know, where, how, where did you learn that don't talk rule? Which role do you most apt to identify with? Of these adult child issues, to what degree is that a problem for you? Where are you maybe in terms of abandonment as a child and how is that related to abandonment today as an adult? Because when I talk about abandonment, today we wanna take a look at what degree do we abandon ourselves? And so those are the kinds of things that I got to in that chapter. But I also believe that I got into some of the steps in terms of the healing process that as adult children, it is important to go back and explore, in essence, your narrative, to go back and to explore that history. The purpose in exploring the history is not to blame a mother or father or that primary caregiver. It is to undo a denial process. I always say you can't be honest today if you have to deny the first 20 years of your life. The other purpose in exploring the negative is in that process, you will identify the losses and you can begin to grieve those losses. So we need to explore the narrative. One of the next steps is we need to be able to learn how to tolerate our feelings without engaging in self-defeating behavior. And I will walk people through exercises in chapter seven with that too. We explore the narrative, we move into our feelings, and then we connect our past to present day. How does the fact that I lived in the fantasy world as a child just for my survivorship affect me today in my personal relationships? How does the fact that it was not safe for me to say no affect me in my work performance? How does the fact that I took care of everybody else's emotional needs affect me in my parenting? So I'll walk you through that very specifically. So we explore the past or that narrative, move into our feelings, connect the past to the present, and then we challenge our beliefs. Were the beliefs I internalized as a child helpful to me and or were they hurtful? You get to hang on to the helpful and and in this book, you get to identify what they were and then which were the ones that are hurtful and those we need to let go of. And then we need to learn skills. You learned a lot of skills. You get to hang on to the skills you learned that were helpful to you. But what were the skills you didn't get to learn? And I'm pretty certain that's what I walk people through in chapter seven. And you did it in a very masterful way. And you really outlined for us a very hopeful way of going past all of the stuff that we handled as children. And by doing that work as an adult and seeing things in a whole different light in a very comfortable way, you take away the fear and the shame and the guilt. And that's a wonderful thing because now we're in a situation where we can feel and we can trust and do it from a safe place. Would you say that was the objective of this book? That is the objective. And I think the ultimate objective is that I no longer live a script, but that today I have choices. And as a consequence of this process that you just described, that will give me choices. 
So many times the choices that I make in my adult life are as a consequence of, of my lack of recovery. And that with recovery, it is genuinely going to uh, give me really the freedom to say yes to life. You know, yes, and I can take responsibility for the decisions that I make today. It's not going to be a family script based on old beliefs that are hurtful to me. It's not going to be based on the fact that I don't have a bunch of skills that I didn't have the chance to learn. Today, I have more skills. Today, I have more helpful beliefs. And I think the real message also in the book, hopefully, is that you're, you're accountable today with how you live your life. Those things may have happened to you. It's important to know what's happened to you. But it's more important to know what it is that you need to address so that you have choices. And, and again, you're the one who's accountable for how you live your life, even if those things happened. It's also very important for us to know by going back there that it's safe to do that. So many people are so afraid because they think that that becomes a big reveal, like you said. With the don't ask, don't tell, that everything should be okay and we don't want to tell the world or I don't even want to explore the fact that my family possibly could have had problems in the work that I'm doing. So that's part of it. But you really give us a safe way to look back into our past and also distinguish what really belongs to us. Like I say all the time to my clients, what tapes are you playing in your head? Are they tapes that were distinguished by your mother or your father? Are they, are they negative influences that really don't apply to you? And people really get a chance to understand and see their parents from a whole different point of view, just like you said, without the anger, without the shame, without the guilt, and really separate themselves from the negativity in their lives. And I do way? want to say is that this is a process and it can take some time and you don't need to do it alone, that there are resources out there to help you uh, do this. And I always say that there's two big resistances to recovery. I like recovery, but I'd like it to be pain free. And I'd like recovery, but I can do this by myself. Thank you. And it's when we allow other people to be a part of the process that they can shine the light and provide the hope as we walk through that pain and come out that other side. And those kinds of resources can vary. They can vary for with being somebody such as Ellen, you know, who is a recovery coach, I believe. So recovery coaches can be helpful in this process, a psychotherapist as well, Ellen is. And so it can be a psychotherapist, but you want somebody who I don't know if I want to say specializes, but has experience working with what we call family of origin issues, because not everybody listening to this was raised in an addictive home, but you're still identifying with the issues. So it can be family of origin. It doesn't have to be somebody who knows family addiction. I also, we have a lot of 12 step programs. If you're questioning your drinking, you're using or a behavior in a compulsive way, there are 12 step programs available. There are other self-help programs available that are not necessarily 12 step and we can Google and quickly begin to find those. In the pandemic, most of them are Zoom um, related, but they're available. And, and actually in some ways that gives you even more anonymity. You're not walking into a local 12 step or self-help meeting in your community. You can be in New Jersey and be in a meeting that's more based in Seattle, or Bainbridge Island, right where I'm at today or around the world. There are Al-Anon meetings for family members where there is addiction. There are other kinds of family support meetings where there is addiction as well and easily found, um, through the internet more today. Um, there are certainly books that are available, and I can talk about that in just a moment, but you don't want to do it in isolation just, just with books. I mean, I'm an author. I want you to buy my books for heaven's sakes, but allow yourself to have access to somebody else. You know, it could be a self-help group um, that, uh, you know, it could be a grief group. Um, where you're not just grieving the immediate loss of someone, but you're grieving the losses that have occurred in the context of your life. Um, and that also can be something that you want to focus on. It's really important today, especially, you know, you said some really, really important things. I've always believed that the opposite of active addiction is not abstinence, but community. The more you connect 
with a variety of people, the greater chance you have, like you said, of allowing good mental health and, and good work and the motivation to do good things and to change your brain sets in. Not only um, the meetings that you mentioned, and there are also very specific ACO A meetings, which is adult children of alcoholics, so that you can commiserate with people that have gone through what you've gone through, but certainly reading um, Dr. Black's book, which gives you insight, and no matter what, opens up your brain, gives you new ideas, so that you're not just always living in your head. When you talked about uh, people being resistant to recovery and saying, it's painful, and I don't want anybody else to know, I just want to do it by myself, those are the two things that are going to kill recovery right then and there. I mean, when I talk to my clients about that, and I say, well, okay, how's that working for you? I don't think so well, okay? So so let's just see what the rest of the world has to say. You don't immediately have to participate, but you have to start listening. And that's really a part of recovery. Learning and listening to what the experts are saying, people like Dr. Claudia Black, and what, what other people are saying, because that's the way you realize that your problems are not specifically unique, and that you can get help around them with really um, learning and educating and being part of a community that's going to support you. Don't you think? We say that addiction is a disease of disconnection, and it's a disease of disconnection from self, emotionally from self, and spiritually from self, and it's a disease of disconnection from others and the ability in which to be genuinely intimate with others, and that recovery is about connection. It is about a, a connection with self, and it is about the ability in which to connect to others, so I totally support what you said. I also want to say that when it comes to resources, you know, I spend most of my professional work today in residential treatment center work, but there are for people with far greater crises, with depression, anxieties, with addictions. We have intensive outpatient treatment programs all across the country, and then we have residential and inpatient, and sometimes that's what's necessary, but it's usually going to be an individual psychotherapist that can help you assess assess, um, the appropriateness, and that's what's indicated in this moment, and I just want people to know today there are hundreds of thousands of people in recovery from growing up with trauma, from growing up with addiction, from uh, experiencing their own addictions, unhealthy relationships. And so allow yourself, one, to be a part of that, but allow yourself to let others of us uh, be a part of that journey. You're absolutely right. And, um, you know, there was a great movie. I forgot the name of the movie, but there are 27 million of us in recovery. I'm sitting here with 35 years in recovery, and I know Claudia has her own recovery because she mentioned it earlier. Um, If you need help with going to a treatment center, one of which Claudia works in, as I mentioned before, the Meadows, if you need help with specific treatment centers, you can go to pushybroadfromthebronx.com and you can click on, um, you can call me at 1 800 889. 1757. I can certainly help facilitate that, answer your questions, and direct you. And also, it will never happen to me. Growing up with addiction as youngsters, adolescents, and adults is available on Amazon and Amazon right now. Amazon.com. Yep, Amazon.com. And the the publisher is Central Recovery Press. And and do hold it up because there's other editions, and you want to be sure you have this last edition. Okay. In this so. last edition, I talk more about the, the trauma that exists within the family. I talk much more in depth about recovery, not just for adult children. I actually talk a lot about young children. For those of you who are still raising children in the home or are part of a community that can influence what's happening with young children who are still school aged children. Well, we have about two minutes, maybe a minute and a half. So I want to ask you, what do you want to leave us with? What's the biggest info you want to take? We want to take away the beginning of the new year, the beginning of the holiday and the beginning of 2021. Well, with hope, Um, you know, I've been in this field for, as I said earlier, for over 40 years. And for me, it's an absolute honor to be witness to the miracles of recovery and that when people recover, they don't just abstain from certain behaviors or abstain from drinking and using. In so many ways, their whole character transforms. Um, You know, I'm no longer afraid to open up the mail, you know, because somebody's, I'm no longer in that fear that somebody's coming after me, that I've done something bad and I'm going to be found out. I'm no longer in fear that people are going to see that I'm really an imposter and, you know, I'm really not that good person that they think that I am. I mean, recovery 
is exciting. Recovery uh, and recovery is just so beautiful. And we have so many models for that. And, and that can happen. I mean, everybody who comes into this recovery place, place of recovery has come from the sense of isolation and oftentimes self-loathing um, in that sense that nobody's really going to understand me. Nobody that help is not going to be available. We know um, and also everybody feels like their sort of narrative, their history, you know, is, it's not as bad as mine. Um, I am so glad that you have left the hope in this. And that's really, really good. I want to just tell you, because we're just about finishing up, Claudia Black, it will never happen to me growing up with addiction as youngsters, adolescents, and adults. It's a fantastic book about recovery. And she's a gal of my own heart because Recovery Recharge is all about the hope in recovery. You've been listening to Recovery Recharged with Certified Life and Recovery Coach Ellen Stewart, pushy broad from the Bronx. Don't miss your next opportunity to let me help you recharge your recovery, let go of your secrets, and change the way you think, feel, and act right here on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Views expressed on this program are those of the host, guests, and callers, and do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its management, or advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio.